you have been quoted in a prominent media uh, magazine as uh, categorically stating that a rights issue is not going to happen. Yet you have got market speculation that the, uh, the that Lonman is going to pursue a rights issue, still making its rounds. Why do you think the market thinks that this is the direction that Lonman will be taking? I guess the market play a lot of scenarios. And what if the price is here and the exchange rate is there and the production is here, what happens? The reality when you run a business is you have to make decisions. Where we are today, we have a net cash position, which is way in excess of our net cash post the rights issue in December 2015, which was 69 million. It's now at end of March when we announced our results was 75 million dollars. Our liquidity has improved post the rights issue from 422 million to 447. So there's enough runway to manage the business provided we are still on the same page we committed that we would we would aim to be cash neutral in this low price environment which we have achieved for the last six quarters since the rights issue so i guess speculation is speculation but the reality is the underlying business is doing well the operational performance is very pleasing and that trajectory continues and those are the things we can control and our liquidity is better. So you say your underlying business is doing well, but if you judge Lonman by what's happening uh, to its share price on the JSC, completely two different stories. So the market perception of Lonman's prospects are that things are looking pretty bleak. Are Lonman's prospects as bleak as they are being valued uh, on the market right now? You know, we don't, mark, we don't comment on, on share prices and share price movement. Our aim as a management of the, organ, of the company is to make sure that we are delivering one on our promises and that we are doing it to the best of producing and managing our controllables. We have managed to contain costs for the last three years. We have managed to reduce high cost production and take it out and bring in profitable production because it's not just volume for the sake of volume. So we've actually managed to reduce costs by taking out 6,000 people. Sadly, as it was, it was necessary to sustain the business. So we've done all the tough things. And right now, as I say to you earlier, we remain cash neutral in this low price envir environment, which means we have maintained the operational flexibility when prices p finally come back. We have ground that is developed and ready for mining for the next 20 months. So we have the industry average is about 12 months. So we have 20 months, which gives us phenomenal operational flexibility that should the market turn, we can switch on the taps. We can produce more. We have fantastic projects where we have sunk a lot of capital like K4, uh, and we have just acquired Pandora Joint Venture, which is a, a joint venture we had with Anglo-American Platinum and Northern. And that acquisition alone, bring synergies of 2.6 billion rands cash. And those are all the levers we're pulling to make sure that we have a robust business that can sustain in this low platinum price. And what about concerns that Lonman is at risk of breaching its debt covenants? Right. So covenants, when we signed the bank facilities, at that time, December 2015, I remember speaking intensely to all stakeholders saying every stakeholder has to take short-term pain for long-term gain. That's why our investors thank thankfully supported us with $400 million. Our bank supported us with about $375 million of facilities. Our employees, unfortunately, we had to sacrifice 6,000 jobs. I have sacrificed my salary, for the la my salary increase for the last three years. So all those things have assisted in making sure that this company remains sustainable. And those are the tough things that we continue to do. So are you at risk of breaching those debt covenants So then? in the covenants, at signing of those facilities, there are covenants of how much capital you can spend. Mm. So now the, this covenant is well achievable, given what I've just explained to you of the 2.6 billion savings that we're getting from the Pandora acquisition, when the acquisition finally kicks in. We have a number of projects that are going to increase. That will increase our NPV, which means it will increase our tangible net worth. 
our bulk tailings project, which has been third party funded of $50 million, is also going to increase our NPV. So I think with all those um, um, additions, it does add up to a tangible net worth. Let's talk about the London listing. So there was a report in a, a prominent newspaper that uh, the PRC would support a move of you uh, terminating your London listing and bringing it here uh, to uh, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So you in the newspaper said that no, this is not something that you would uh, consider at this stage, but is this something as part of your, 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 your strategy to minimize costs? Is this something that you would perhaps relook? I think that we are always doing things that is in the best interest of all our stakeholders, including our investors and shareholders. The key benefits of the London listing and Johannesburg I think it's important to highlight that we are both listed in Johannesburg and in London. When we did the rights issue, about 60% of that f investment came from our international markets and about 40% came from South Africa. So the benefits are very clear as to what this provides. But indeed, the symbolic opportunity of saying, how do we make this a South African investment only? would be exciting, but the reality is you actually have to understand the sources of funds and the need for our own South Africa to actually have inflows of hard currencies into the country. And that listing provides for that opportunity. And we saw the benefits of it at the 2015 rights issue. Yeah. And in terms of those foreign investors, how, what are they saying in response to the news, I'm sure, of the political uncertainty that they're reading here in South Africa? Are they concerned? They are indeed concerned. Mm -hmm. I think everybody realizes that there's many noises around where South Africa is. I guess the noise is inherent in a constitutional democracy. But the reality that they get is that indeed the assets are here. We continue companies that are able to navigate these complexities, like Lonman is doing, are continuing to do so. And we have to have the confidence that this is an environment we can navigate. And I'm, I, I see that navigation continuously. And the pleasing underlying performance, despite these political noises, the pleasing performance we have seen and continues up today gives me comfort that uh, we are telling our investors that indeed as there are noises, the underlying value continues and your investment continues. But there are indeed concerned. I think one of the biggest concerns they also have is where are the markets going? How are the markets improving? Where will the, be the platinum demand long term? And if you want a cleaner environment, if you want a green world, platinum is the answer. So definitely the long term prospects which our investors are looking for and do you see that platinum price improving in the near term? I think the lower prices are, look like they're here for longer. When things are tough, possibly everybody expects them to be tough forever. Uh, but it's good so that we can also tighten our belts more. So we're now making, able to break even at these prices. When it was impossible to break even at 1,200, we're now able because we've tightened belts. So they may be here for longer. But we really believe that the tightening of supply and the underinvestment in providing supply is going to drive prices more than just the increase in global demand. And uh, talking about that cost tightening, so you are moving uh, your very lush uh, Mauro offices here in Mauro's Arch, beautiful office by the way, you're taking the headquarters uh, back to uh, Marikana there. So how has staff responded to this move? Because surely uh, it's, it's a change of lifestyle for them. It is indeed a change of lifestyle, but I think it's a very obvious uh, step in the right direction of how we have been cutting costs. It sends the right message about cutting costs. But the real benefits for this move to operations is being hands-on, being at the face. With the flatter structures we have created, the increased performance we have seen in the last few months is because I have actually spent most of my time in the last few months at the operations, not in, Mar in, in, in Melrose. So we have seen the benefits of that, being closer and supporting our operational management teams, because that's actually where it happens. So the benefits to the organization and to all our stakeholders and shareholders is clear, and we're moving because it's a step change 
in our approach to get closer to our operations and deliver even more for our, for our stakeholders. It will indeed benefit us in terms of costs. It will also reduce costs, which is another lever that I'm sure most town people think there aren't any more levers to do so. But here is one opportunity that we have seized to make sure that we remain cash neutral. But have you had any staff members that have said, you know, Marikana, it's very far, uh, the distance I won't be able to endure. Um, sorry, Ben, but I can't support this move. Here is my letter of resignation. I think what we are looking at right now is a very constructive engagement with our employees. They've all understood it. We have about 32 employees in this office, and they all realize the need to do this and the rationale behind it. And so we are engaging and saying, What's the best way? What, how would it suit you and your circumstances that we move to Marikana? Do you need the new world today is, is there an element of flexi time in the way we work? Is there an element of working with the world of IT and, and media? Is there no ways that we can find each other? But how often can we expect you at the operations? And I think the employees, I'm very encouraged that they have seen that opportunity and they've seen that it is crucial for the business to do that and they're all on board contributing their thoughts as to how we could do that as seamlessly with all the respect and care that we require. So there's been good support and appreciation of, of the move and uh, anyone who wants to move is welcome to move with us. We are giving it a, a, a bit of a period, almost like four months, six months, to make sure employees can test what they would rather do. And in terms of your uh, cost management strategy, if we actually stay with that subject, is there any more room to cut fat in the business? <laughs> I think if you asked me a year ago, I possibly would have said no, but you continue to find these opportunities. So I think there is, it's getting tougher, it's getting more difficult to find these low-hanging fruits are now gone. But you know what, we are here to drive the aim of being cash neutral until these until this low prices improve to make sure we provide ourselves the best opportunity to grow when the world turns again. So you had, did mention earlier on that 6,000 jobs had been lost and you are in the process, process of closing a couple of shafts. Uh, any more job losses on the cards? What we're doing right now with the process is to make sure that we focus on profitable ounces. So some of these shafts that are closing, we're closing high cost areas, moving our production crews, our employees, to profitable areas. So it's not just about job losses. We aim to minimize job losses, but in the event we also reskill our employees and redeploy them. We use natural attrition to make sure that we possibly don't recruit as much, but allow the employees that are in place to have jobs for longer. We're looking at all those options to make sure that we can sustain jobs as much as we can because we know they are needed. But there are times when economic realities may dictate otherwise and will take those tough decisions then. And in terms of your relations with uh, the labor unions, how's that going? Uh, Joseph Matunja is in the, 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 uh, the building, as I understand. He's awaiting for you in uh, your office. How are uh, labor relations there with, with unions? We have come a long way, Fifi, with our relationships. They are, they are mature, but you can never be complacent. So we've worked very hard and we are finding each other, we're sharing information on a continual basis so that everybody understands the circumstances of the company, but we can never be complacent. And it takes two to tango. So yes, I'm going to see Joseph just now because we really want to engage on how do we continue to make sure Lonmin succeeds for their members, for our employees. Regarding the, the recent protests uh, that we've been hearing and reading about, how are things there, particularly the youth protests uh, with the thousands or so of youth who are wanting uh, jobs? Have you managed to stabilize uh, things on that front in Maragana? It has stabilized, but we remain committed to engage with them to understand their needs. But given what I've just explained to you about economic realities, it's a it's work in progress, and we believe we'll find each other. But it is challenging, there's unemployment, there's no, there's poverty, and we have to find each other. But I believe with our commitment to work together, we'll find a sustainable solution.